Okay, so now we want to continue with our discussion of Chapter 7. Um, we talked about cell membranes at the end of the last video and saw that they're made of these this phospholipid bilayer. These are a bunch of individual phospholipids that are in two layers. Again, with the fatty acids on the inside, those hydrophobic portions of the molecule, and the phosphate end on either side of the membrane, the hydrophilic end. So that's the end that is basically water loving, that will stick to water. And of course, the inside of the cell has water and the outside of the cell has a water-based solution. All right, so we've said how membranes are selectively permeable and they will let some things through and some things not easily pass through the membrane. All right, so transport is extremely important for cells because cells have to get things in and out of them. And there's a couple, there's two main ways of transport, passive and active. Passive transport, this is when there is no energy required. And essentially things are moving from where there's more of them to where there's less of them where there's a higher concentration of that thing to a lesser concentration. So if you spray something in a room, uh, some air freshener, it'll smell really strong at the point where you just spray it because it's really concentrated there. But then that material will begin to diffuse throughout the room and begin to smell throughout the room. But of course, not with the same intensity because now this substance has reached equilibrium, it's spread out, it's relatively diffuse. That's sort of the natural way of things. Things like to diffuse from where there's more of them to where there's less of them. And so here we see some kind of substance that's able to pass through a membrane. And if you start with a lot of it on one side, when you've reached equilibrium, you'll have the same amount on either side. So that's just your basic diffusion. Now, we've said that some things can't easily pass through membranes but sometimes the cell would like to have that thing move from one side to the other. So there may be more of it on one side and you want to get more of it on the other side. Well, these things that can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer have to take advantage of facilitated diffusion. That is, they need some help getting across. There are membrane proteins that provide a pathway for them to move across. Good example of this is water. You'll recall that water is a polar covalent molecule. It has a positive side and a negative side. So because of that charge that it has, that polarity, it will stick to the phosphate side. It cannot pass through a phospholipid bilayer. So it needs some help. And I'll come back to that other slide in a minute. So there are these things called aquaporins which are these membrane proteins that provide a pathway for water to move across or through the membrane. Again, the water can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer, but it can pass through these aquaporins. And so when we talk about the diffusion of water, we're specifically talking about osmosis. Osmosis, the diffusion of water. Here we have this setup, this container, where we've got a differentially permeable or selective permeable membrane. Some things can pass through, some cannot. This membrane will allow the water molecules to pass through, but these large sucrose molecules can't pass through because they're too big. So essentially, you'll have water moving both ways, but as the large pinkish arrow shows, the net movement of water is from the right to the left because there is less water on this side and more water on this side. And when I say more, I mean per unit area. If you took the equal three-dimensional area on either side, there are essentially more water molecules per unit area on the left side than fewer on the right side. The water will want to move from where there's more of it to where there's less of it. 
So let's look here and apply some more terms to this. So, hypotonic, isotonic, hypertonic. All right, these are terms that allow you to compare different solutions and the nature of those solutions, okay? So here, we're going to have these cells. We've got a plant, a plant cell down below here, an animal cell up above. And we're going to put both of those cells into a hypotonic solution. So the solution surrounding them is hypotonic and the solution inside of each of the cells is hypertonic. Now, what does that mean? A hypertonic solution has more solute. Whoops, come on, don't do that. So a hypertonic solution equals more solute. Or, on the other hand, less water. Whereas a Hypotonic solution means less solute or more water. So the hypotonic solution per unit area, per unit volume, has more water, and the hypertonic has less. So where does the water want to move? From where there's more of it to where there's less of it. So these cells that are put into a hypotonic solution are going to take in a net flow of water into that cell. You take the same cells and put them in a hypertonic solution. Now the solution is hypertonic. It has more solute. And the inside of the cells is hypotonic. So what's going to happen? This water is going to move out of the cells now into the hypertonic surroundings and the cells will shrivel up and shrink. So you get the opposite things depending on what kind of solution you put those cells in. You put them in a hypertonic solution, they gain water. Hypertonic solution, they lose water. Well, it just so happens plant cells like to be under hypertonic conditions. They like to be absorbing water. That keeps their cells full of water. Their cells won't burst because they have a cell wall. However, Animal cells don't like this because if they start gaining too much water, they don't have a cell wall, they can burst or they can split open or lice. Neither of those types of cells like to be under hypertonic conditions, losing water. Cells don't really like to lose water. See, the animal cell shrivels up and the plant cell does what's called plasmolysis. That's where the cell membrane pulls away from the cell wall. It's not a good state for them. Now, if you put those cells into isotonic conditions, you can see that they do just fine. So again, under isotonic conditions, that's where there's neither, there's water basically moving both in and out of the cell, but they equal each other such that there is no net flow of water out of the cell. They are isotonic. They are in equilibrium with their surroundings. There's the same amount of water and solutes outside the cell as inside the cell. That's the condition that animal cells like to be in. Plant cells are okay with that, but they'd rather be in what we call this turgid condition where they're absorbing water as opposed to flaccid or plasmalized. So what happens is when you have water moving from one side of a membrane to another, you can create what's called osmotic pressure. So if you've got a semi-permeable membrane, and you've got water, a net flow of water this side, you'll have basically higher pressure over here and less pressure over here. And that pressure that you create when water is diffusing is known as osmotic pressure. All right, active transport. This is where you are using energy. And typically it's to move something against the concentration gradient. You're moving it from where there's less of it to where there's more of it. And as we saw with diffusion, that's not the natural state. Things tend to move from where there's more to less. And so when a cell makes things move from where there's less of them to more of them, they have to use energy. And as we'll see when we study some subsequent chapters, ATP is this molecule that's often used to provide the energy to do this cellular work, this active transport. Active transport can also occur 
under these conditions where you're manipulating the membrane. You can see we're going to take in a large quantity of this material, what's sometimes called bulk transport, at one time. We're going to do that by forming this little pocket in the membrane, this little infolding, and wrap the membrane around this stuff, and then a piece of the membrane breaks off and forms a little vesicle, and now that stuff is inside the cell, inside this membrane-bound ball, and it takes energy to do this, to manipulate this membrane. When you take something in, it's called endocytosis. You can do the opposite, where you spit something out in large quantities using these membrane balls that fuses with the cell membrane, and this is known as exocytosis. Takes energy. All right, so this cell transport is important for cells to maintain homeostasis, to maintain relatively constant conditions. Um, and of course, cells need to maintain homeostasis and take advantage of transport, of course, when they grow, to respond to changing environmental conditions, to make use of energy, and of course, to reproduce, to basically do the things that living things need to do. So, for example, a cell is consuming sugars inside of it, its food, and as those become in shorter supply, it's going out of homeostasis. So you'll want to transport more of those sugars into the cell, for example. We talked about these vacu um, vacuoles, and in particular the contractile vacuole that we see in these organisms known as paramecians. And it helps them maintain homeostasis. They live in freshwater environments. They're constantly absorbing water. And that, if they absorb too much, again, they would lice or split open. So in order to maintain homeostasis, the contractile vacuole, here's one that's not quite full, but here's one that's full of water. And when it becomes full of water, it will expel that water out. So it has a mechanism to deal with this excess water it's absorbing to help maintain homeostasis. So single-celled organisms have a single cell that does everything they need, and one paramecium cell is pretty much just like any other paramecium cell. But when we get to multicellular organisms, we start to see cell specialization. Cells start to have particular jobs. Um, if you're a skin cell, for example, your job is to be a protective covering for that organism. Whereas if you're the cell that lines the inside of the lungs, you have cells whose job is to, in particular, do gas exchange. Okay, That is CO2 out, oxygen in. Um, and these cells also have a lot of cilia on them, these little hair-like projections, sort of like small versions of flagella, because their job is to move things out of the lungs. When you breathe in, you breathe in little dust particles, and they get into your lungs, and the cilia in the lungs help sort of sweep this stuff out of your lungs. <clears throat> and another example, of course, blood cells. All cells we touch ha we have in our lungs, our skin, our blood, but again, they have a different job. Their job, of course, is to carry oxygen to your cells and to take CO2 away this waste product back to the lungs. Um, and the same thing in plant. Here's a cross section of a leaf, and we see lots of, you've got sort of these cells that are the outer covering that don't do photosynthesis. You've got a bunch of cells in the middle here that do photosynthesis. But then you have others, this bundle here, this is a uh, bundle of vascular tissue whose job is to move water around the plant. So again, cell specialization and so we can talk about different levels of organization in such an organism like us, for example. Of course, you have atoms made molecules, and molecules are put together to make individual cells. But then cells are put together in what we call tissues, which are groups of cells that have the same job. And then you can take different tissues and put them together into a structure we would call an organ. So they're groups of tissues that have the same job, like your heart, for example, is an organ that consists of muscle tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, but their whole job is to pump blood around the body. All right, I'm running out of time. We'll talk about cell communication in class.